welcome to the Open Hardware Summit Rome 2014. Uh, it's been a big year for the Open Source Hardware uh, Association, the parent organization of the Open Hardware Summit. We are thrilled and proud to announce that we officially received our nonprofit status. Um, in addition, I want to quickly welcome and thank the sponsors that have made the Ada Lovelace Fellowships for Women to attend the summit possible this year. Um, and I'd like to welcome all the women who are here on those fellowships. Uh, also, um, Alicia Gibbs, who is one of the founders of the Open Source Hardware Association, as well as the founder of the Open Source Summit, or Open Hardware Summit, excuse me, um, has released a book, Building Open Source Hardware, uh, which, feature, which features many of our speakers today in the book who have written chapters, Becky Stern, uh, Kip Bradford, David Mellis, um, among others. There's coupons available at the front desk if you're interested in purchasing the book. I highly recommend it. Uh, finally, I would like to welcome David to do the opening remarks as one of the founders and members of the open hardware community in Europe. Well, if I was going to be loyal to where I come from, I should make this speech, in, this speech in Spanish. But you didn't get your translation system right. You know, Spanish, Italian, Italian, English, or whatever you come from. For the first time in a really, really long time, I'm going to make my, my presentation slideless. So I'm slideless in Rome. I feel a bit like Tom Hanks. Um, I have to ask this question before I go on. How many of you are are academics, you know, ready to university somehow. Okay, this is very scary. Um, I would expect a lot more people in the, you know, 13 to 15 year of age in the crowd, but you look all between, you know, different ages. I will not refer to your ages. <clears throat> so since I, since I got the opportunity of making the opening remarks for the open source, for the open hardware summit, I always include, include, include the source thing in the, in the world. I, well, I, I first want to acknowledge, I want to thank the city of Rome for this beautiful location. Uh, we could certainly have had a room half the size. We would feel more like a family. But it's good that it's big. Big is big, big is good, like in the United States. And you see, we're in Europe. This is why we make smaller things in Europe. Um, I want to remind you about what happened in 2012, if I recall when there was the Open Hardware Summit at IBEAM. And the um, uh, famous 3D printer community went close. And a pretty famous author started talking about hybrid models, where there were going to be open ingredients and closed ingredients. Well, that same day, I got a stomach pain really, really big, and I had to leave the building. But before I go on ranting about different things, let me introduce myself a little bit better, because you guys I'm pretty sure you don't know me. You don't know I'm a believer. I mean, this is very convenient because we're in Rome, very close to the Vatican. So I'm a believer. I, I don't believe in God, really, which is inconvenient. But I believe in people. Like, I believe in you, in all of you. I even believe in those that are not in the empty seats. You know, as a kid, since I believe in everybody, I was bullied constantly. And uh, when I started dating girls, I always ended up in this situation where they told me, don't call me, I call you. And I totally believe in them. Because I believe in people. And that goes on until today. So when I got my first research job, probably my only, let's say, paid research job, because as in Arduino, I, well, that's a long story. But when I got my first research job in 1999, I moved to Germany to work in one of the largest silicon manufacturing or silicon design laboratories in the world in Munich. We were 8,000 people wearing white clothes. Uh, I like to call them pajamas, but I know it's not very OK. And uh, this was a lot about me and my screen. You know, I spent the days looking at transistors drawn automatically by algorithms that were generated by somebody who had written this thing that transformed BHDL into transistors. And I look at them just to make sure they weren't really overlapping the wrong way. 
And I thought at some point, after nine months, this is not good. A professor of mine told me, a job is like giving birth. After nine months, you know it's going to go fine or it's not going to go at all. And exactly at nine months, I realized this is not going to go anywhere. So I quit. And I became a professor at an art and design institution in Sweden to earn half the amount of money and work twice as much. So I was getting so stressed out. I mean, I'm joking, I, but imagine, I was, imagine me stressed out. So I started to take residences around the world. So I went to Istanbul. I went to different countries. I ended up in Italy where I met my partners, and the rest, the rest is history. You know, we made Arduino. So I want to quote Rifkin. I want to quote Rifkin because everything I'm going to say today is actually, that's why I talked about academics earlier, is actually centered around two philosophers. One is Camille de Toledo, and the other one is Rifkin. So Rifkin says, individuals of the 21st century will not understand themselves as autonomous agents fighting for survival. They will not understand freedom as built on top of private property. You know, I totally identify with this thing. You know, I believe in you. So I cannot identify myself with private property because I believe that we share something together. So I'm trying to answer this question of why open source. I believe that there is room for a greater, for a greater good. So I also believe that there should be something that I like to call the knowledge, knowledge tax. I think there should be a way so that when public money is invested in research and development, they should pay back, but not with money. They should pay back with knowledge. The knowledge should be open. So I want to call the European, European Commission to actually open as much as possible from the research projects paid with public money. That basically is my taxes. Then I also would like to answer the question, what is open source useful for? I have to tell you guys, don't be blinded by this. Open source is not fucking useful. You know, you know, we make things useful. You make things useful. You know, don't just go invent something and then try to find a use for it. Just create something because you need it. Go some, create something because somebody else needs it. Go create stuff. Um, on the other hand, looking at open source as a creation per se, you know, I said create something that is useful. Well, open source per se, open source hardware in particular, is useful because it helps us reclaim the physical world, the physical world we've given to somebody else. Again, quoting Camille de Toledo in this case, information society makes us forget about our bodies. Open source can give us our bodies back. And <clears throat> yes, in a very journalistic move, I answer why and what. I should answer now where. So where does, where does open source come from? And for this, I would like to abandon the discussion about who was the name, who was the person that gave open source the name, who, or the discussion between free source or free, as in free beer, or, or open source, or, you know, there is this guy with the long hair uh, that used to be at MIT that always fights about this discussion. But beyond that discussion, we have to face the fact that we live in a capitalist society, at least in Europe. It's a society that has learned how to take all creations as cultural products and from that point of view, give them a commercial value. And this again, quoting Camille. This means that giving to everything this kind of value is forcing us to create structures that will justify the only thing that matters, which is making money. You know, the bling bling. I spent the last two days talking about to my friends about the Open Source Harvest Summit 2012 and what happened there and how bad I felt about it. And the only thing I could come out with was to reinvent the, the, the chicken yolk. You know why did the chicken cross the street to the other side? Because it could smell of money. <clears throat> so what I would like you guys to go home with is just a very, very simple lesson. And with this, I'm going to close my opening remarks. It's as simple as, simple as this. You you don't need to compromise anything. Just make things right. Make things right. Make things open. Thank you.